see something like this. You know, and this is a perfect stand here, and these guys haven't come up, it's probably your seed vitality. You know, and that was actually a heading in my original outline, you know. Seed vitality is critical. Fedco Seed Catalog, one of my favorite catalogs. They, they talk about seed care and they say in there, don't leave your seeds in the greenhouse. Next sentence, not for 10 minutes. You know, because seeds, the way to keep them, right, is you take 100, right? And that's the number that you want your humidity and your temperature to be at. That is not easy to reach in Western North Carolina. You know? um, in fact, I don't think many of us get there, but we want to aim for it. The best trick that I find is you buy your seeds this time of year when our houses are pretty dry, you put them in glass jars and seal them tight. Do not believe that if you put them in a plastic container that it's, it's going to be impervious to the moisture. It doesn't work. But a sealed tight glass jar will be good and dry. Then you can keep them in the basement or a cool space and they'll last a long time. But it's also the seed. Onions, spinach, mosh, parsnips, very short-lived seed. Chervil, lovage, all those seeds really work much better fresh. You, know? you can get, you can use onions one, two years sometimes, spinach two years, but not if you didn't take good care of the seed. You know? In fact, I keep those seeds in the freezer. And there's a the whole debate about whether you should put seeds in the freezer. Yeah. But my argument is, well, how do they save our germplasm for the future? In freezers. I've got seed that I'm using now for 10 years. It's fine. You know, I had bean seed, this crescent bean seed that I saved. The kids helped me plant it right now. It was older than they were. You know, they were like 13 and 14. It was 14 years old. For the younger ones, that seed was, was, was grown the year before they were born. You know, and germination wasn't perfect, but it was in the high 60s. The spinach, actually, this is a good one to talk about here. It's good for two reasons. Um, this flat here is pretty thick, right? Jeremy planted two seeds per flat, per, per, pat, per cell. It's pretty darn thick, right? Probably even a little too thick, but if you space the plants well, it'll still be fine, right? This one here was only planted a week later, and you can see that it's not near as far along. And the reason for that is, Right prior to Jeremy planting this one, I'd seeded a couple of flats we put out, and the germination was terrible. And I thought, oh, the seed is, it was a year old, it had been in a walk-in, so I thought it'd still be good. I thought the seed was on its way out, we better sell it thicker. I told him to sow too. And then I came in a week later and I was paranoid, because these weren't coming up real fast. I sowed even more. These are way too thick, that's why they're not, not doing as well. Okay, the big lesson from this was, it wasn't the seed. It wasn't seed vitality. I don't know what it was, but a good guess, and it's actually great that I'm teaching that right now, Mackerel is a wonderful soil, right? John cannot convince them that they should invest in the infrastructure to mix their soil well. They use a front-end loader. Mixing with a front-end loader is only as good as the operator. You know, When you have large piles of compost, as, as the compost is drying, the salts evaporate up with the water. But then as the water goes off, the salts stay on the surface there. If you don't mix those salts, which are actually nutrients, right? They're not bad. They're nutrients. But in concentrations, they're terrible, right? If you don't mix them thoroughly back in, they will inhibit germination. I think the odds are very good that I didn't follow my own advice because I was in a hurry. And I didn't mix the macaroon very well. I highly recommend that every bag you get, you very, very thoroughly mix it. Because it can have salt concentrations and you can have problems. You know? If you forget to mix it and you want to give them a hard time, please do because we're trying to teach them they need to, you know, get a mixer and stop relying on their front end loader, you know. Um, so I suspect that's what it was. So you can't always tell. I said it was seed vitality up there. I know it was for that hot soy because it's about five years old, you know. And I'm surprised it germinated as good as it did. You know, I, I now sell three or four seeds to a cell to use it up. But that, I'm sure it was seed vitality. The spinach, it wasn't. And you just have to be aware of that. We talk about how to tell when it's time to fertilize. That's when, you know, if you start seeing yellowing leaves on the bottom, it's because it's running out of nutrition. This is a growing in Mackinac, but it's been in here since um, 1110. You know, that's a long time. Okay, and the last thing I guess I want to look at here is these lupins. Now, even though they look nice and lush, the same thing is happening. These things were started a long, long time ago. And they're starting to run out of steam too. You know, they need they need to be stepped up again, or better yet, to go out in the garden. And you know, I can't even say we grow that for a beneficial insect plant. It's not that great for ben we grow that because it makes our hearts sing. Yeah, it just makes us happy. That's it. You know, 
There's all different reasons to grow things. This is Claytonia, also known as Miner's Lettuce. Are people familiar with that one? I've heard of it. It's a spectacular... In fact, I'll be glad to send you all home with a plant or two to try, you know. It, unlike mosh, is not totally winter hardy, but simply row cover will probably be all it needs. It's in the same family as purslane, so it's high in omega-3 fatty acids, probably. You can kind of feel it, too, when you bite into it, you know, like purslane. It's not as succulent as purslane. Totally tender and mild, never gets bitter, really pretty. Um, this is starting to show you what it'll look like more. The um, flowers come right up out through the leaf kind of, so they're very ornamental. Um, and an amazing self-seeder like the marsh. Once you have it, if you take a plant or two home today, you've let it go to seed, you'll never have to buy seed again. You know? Why I'm showing it to you is, this might be the best example of, a plant, of plants that are starting to run out of steam. Um, and really on the ends you can see it the most, that's probably from drying out, but if they were had a little bit more um, food, they probably would be a little more vigorous and wouldn't be getting hit as hard, you know. And so they're just due to go in. It's as simple as that. I mean, and the problem is we put all these other things in the greenhouse. I don't know where I'm going to put them. You know? so, I gotta, so I have to find a place where I might end up putting them outside under row cover. But I really want them to be in the greenhouse so they go to seed so we always have it, you know, and we never have to plant it again. Okay, let's look at the sweat box actually and at the um, heat table. This one I turned down, but you know what? It's probably not going to be... You won't know that it's on. Because it's too warm in here. So, I just leave it at 72 and it works fine. And you can see the setup right here. The, um, the um, what's it called? Uh, the element is right down in here. I guess you can't see it. Right here is the remote bulb thermostat. Okay. Um, so you're using this... This is just to pop the seed. You know? Every seed that you germinate just popped in here. I would do that. Right. You know, frankly, Jeremy doesn't you know think it matters as much so he doesn't do it. We're kind of a democracy here. You know? I built it basically to show people how to do it. You know, and we, we love having it for things like peppers and things that are hard to germinate. You know? But the brassicas, I have a hard time saying you really need to put the brassicas in there because who has trouble getting brassicas to pop? You know? Uh, my friend Wade at Troy's who taught me how to make this, he doesn't use it for the brassicas because he can't remember to check it often enough and they get too leggy. That's why I have plastic top put on top of it. So there's some light in there. Because if they get away from you in the dark, they're really going to get leggy. You know? And basically cabbages will pop in a day. You know? That's how fast they pop at this. You know? So I, t I tend, they're really great for, it's really great for like the flowers that are hard to germinate. The um, carrot family stuff, that's like the cilantro and stuff. Peppers, tomatoes, squash, things that just, you know, for some reason the seeds a little, the shell's a little harder, they don't pop very fast. That's what it works best for, you know. That's what I, I love it for, you know. But at, when I started my own plants at Celo, everything went in there. And they were all out in no time flat, and that just moved me along, you know. Um, and I always, you know, the other thing is, it really does help you if you've not taken good care of your seeds. Seed that wouldn't germinate as well will germ germinate better in here. So that's the purpose. Now the other end, you see the other key piece here. Which I, this door is hard to open, but I'll try and get it so I can open it. And you can see it from the inside. And this one here, it's a float valve. Come on around here so you can see it, yeah. Um, it's a float valve, and that theoretically keeps you from frying your element, right? Because if you have this on without a, a way for water to continuously top it off, what's going to happen is at some point it's going to go dry and it fries your element. I've killed about six so far. Even since I've had the float valve, I've killed two. Because somebody walks in and turns the water off at the source. You know? Or the, the spring clogs up and I don't get water to it, you know? There's just... Fortunately, they're cheap and easy to replace. You know? It's not a big deal. Um, like I say, for, for probably for your scale, for sure, I would just use a um, vaporizer. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go with this. This is probably way beyond the home grower's purpose. Mm -hmm. And indeed, you might be happy perfectly with those domes. Right. They might do enough, you know. You might put the dome on top of the fridge for something like pepper so you get a little bit of heat, mm -hmm. you know. And make sure your soil is good and wet. Then that, that rising humidity from the soil is probably enough. Mm -hmm. you know? But first, if you're growing a lot of plants, this is a real winner, you know. And I bet, never tried it, but I bet that things like rosemary and lavender, instead of 15%, are at 25% in this, you know. They're still going to be tough, but they'll be not quite as tough. Soil blocks that are kind of like on the same size as a, a four-pack. 
So this is going to make a pretty spectacular. We could demo uh, some soil blocks if you want, you know. And soil blocks, I think, are at their best for things like beets that are, are cucurbits that don't like being transplanted but want, you know, you want to get some size on them. Because as Eric Coleman goes into this in greater detail than I, t I do, if you want to read The New Organic Grower, but there's actually much more volume of soil in this block, which is a total cube, than there is in most cells because they're actually those slope sides are taking up a lot of soil, you know. That's designed purposely that way because it means you can fit more plants in and you're not using as much soil, which matters to the big growers. But if you're going for best practice, this might be a way to do it. But um, I've been real happy with them when I do it. The other thing to say about them is you sure are putting a lot of soil on the ground that way. You know, you're using much more soil. So if that's a good thing for you, fine. If it's expensive and you don't want to, maybe not as fine, you know. The heat table it won't take us long to talk about that. The source is Farm Tech. F-A-R-M-T-E-K. And I think it was about $80 or so for enough to do this table. There's two sets in here. Each one does six square feet or 12 square feet, and this is 24 square feet or something like that. And why is the gravel here? Anybody got an idea? It kind of stabilizes the heat. That's one good thing. Um, if the power went off, there'd still be some warm rock for a while. But the big reason. And the best example I know was when I gave a talk about making one of these tables at the Southern Sog Conference in New Orleans. Somebody was listening to the talk said, you know, I didn't use the gravel one time, folks. Be sure you use the gravel. I burned my house down. One of these wires shorts out on a wooden shelf or a flammable surface, you're gone. <coughs> if, it's, if it shorts out in the gravel, no big deal. You know? I mean, you don't want to touch it. You know, It's going to be live, you know, but it's not going to start a fire. Gravel doesn't burn. You know? So that's the big reason. The other thing that's critical to know about this is, and they tell you in the directions, just believe them, you cannot let one part of the heat cable cross the other one. It'll overheat, melt, and short out. They have to be separate. So what we do is make, we had blue board on the bottom of this for energy efficiency, and we didn't, we had staples like you use for fencing, but they were too small. So we just took wire and made little staples and bent it over and locked them in place, you know, and that's it. So you put a layer of gravel down, these cables have their own thermostat, so they're cheaper. That's why I did it, because I'm trying to show the cheaper ways. Mine, mine, I have three of these up in CeeLo, and I have the same kind of thermostat on it. You know, I can run two off of one, off of one thermostat, you know, but it's still 50 bucks for the thermostat. You know, the cables cost just as much. So, but I can control it. This, you don't have any control. It's always at 72. I can say, hey, I want my peppers to come up a little faster, and I can turn them up to 75 or 78, and they'll come up a little faster. You know? That's the difference. So we wanted to take this and put a dome over it. Yes. And put water. some water in it. Well, no, steam. this wouldn't need water. No, that you do your steam in there, or you use the things. You know, you could actually though. You would actually if you had, if you just made it. You know, maybe put some little um, right. PVC hoop like hoops here. You know, somehow put maybe a little greenhouse out of it and put plastic over it. Yeah. If you then watered on this, you'd be making steam all the time. Right. Because as this got heated. It'll be evaporating, and you'll be you'll be getting that high moisture. You know? yeah. It won't be as powerful as that. You know, that's the professional germination chamber. This covered in plastic is the small. You know, I would make one of these before I made that. You know, this is probably the first thing to make. You know, right. um, this is a total winner. What I love this for most of all is you don't have to heat a whole greenhouse, and you can still have ideal temperatures. You know, so right now, it's for these guys. You know. Um, later on, as it gets warmer, we can step these guys up and it, it won't be a problem. But right now, we have to have a greenhouse not at 40, but at least 53 because peppers and eggplant stunt. They start stunting at 53, below 53 degrees. You know? So, so this should be indoors, not outdoors. Yeah, or you're going to have to, you know, you basically run a lot more electricity. You can still use movable insulation to have it outdoors, you know. But then you got to protect from the rain as far as electricity goes, you know. Well, if you put it inside a small hoop house, a hoop house. Like you built bingo, you got out it. there, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Totally. That'll work just great, yeah. Absolutely. That's the system that I would recommend for, you know, if you want to ramp up your production of seedlings, you'd make a table like this, you know. And, then you, and you know, you could also do this, do this in, in the ground and have it, have it in soil, you know. And Is then you might... draining underneath here or just solid? It, it, it's going to drain because of, we didn't try to keep it from not draining in the, uh, this, the construction seat. It's going to drain right out there. You can see where that's not going to hold water. And on the sides. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It drains enough, you know. <coughs> I mean, if you stood here with a hose and just poured the water on, you might fill it up for a while, but it would drain out. You know? And I won't say that'll never happen here. You never know. Somebody could be talking to somebody and just like, you know. <laughs> but
But it, we don't want that, and that hopefully won't happen. I believe fifth, fifth, fifth season has some tape, too. Okay. I was just up there today, and uh -huh. I thought I saw it. But. Uh huh. Yeah, mm. it's a cool little thing to have. You know? um, I, I love these tables. I love them most because I don't have to heat the whole greenhouse. You know? Frankly, I don't know that I'd be willing to start these real early ones. Because we're not starting very many. It's just way too much energy. Even though we're burning wood, you know? You go up 13 more degrees, that's a lot more wood. You know? 40 degrees is no big deal. You know? The principle they work on is that they're no bother because they, they got a thermostat that turns a fan on and off when you need heat. But that means the fire has to smolder all the time so the fan can light up. What happens when the fire smolders is it puts creosote in the air like crazy. You know? <coughs> they're actually, those things are illegal in a lot of northeastern states now. And they're going to be on their way out here. I mean, you could smell the Huge creosote. Huge fire boxes. Yeah. They, they're trying to sell more of them than yeah. that for houses now. Yeah. Well, they, they certainly are renewable energy, but they're the wrong design. Yeah. yeah. There's a future, and it's called a gasifier, but that's another whole discussion.